Hello everyone, this is Beastly Eel here, and in today's video, we're going to be talking about the latest episode of X-Men 97. Remember It is the name of the episode, and if you have not seen it, there are major spoilers ahead, so please make sure to stop this video, watch the episode, because I promise you, most people will not be happy with the spoilers I'm about to give. So let's get right into it. There's two parts into this episode. One is the X-Men, and the other one is Genosha. There's a reason why I'm saying it that way. If you've seen it, you'll understand, even though some of the X-Men go to Genosha. So I'm going to talk briefly about the X-Men one, and then move on to the um, Genosian story. The Gen Genosian story is obviously longer, but it is also the most important one of all. So, let's get right into it. So, apparently, um, the X-Men are being interviewed because they're now being open about their abilities and everything else, and the fact that the Genosian leader is going to be brought into the UN, the United Nations, and having a, a seat at the table. So, trying to understand mutants in general. Um, and so, we're interviewing, so she interviews Beast, um, they interview Cyclops, um, Beast was a nice little back and forth between the two, you know, a little bit of flirting. Um, there was also a little bit of talking with Jubilee, explaining kind of how like school works there and how it's a lot of hands-on learning instead of like the boring traditional learning, um, that she's used to in other schools. And then we have Cyclops and she begins to talk with him about leadership and everything else. Um, at first they're trying to get good like camera angles and they can't with his glasses. So they decide that he's going to sit down. So then they start talking about their relationship, AKA him and Marvel girl, which is for those of you who don't know the original, um, alias that was given to Jean Grey in the beginning of her time in the X-Men. So, um, he basically explains the time where she had been engulfed by the Phoenix and talking about their time together at that point. And it's both him and Jean going back and forth, talking about their sides of it and basically confessing their love to each other, even though they're not together at this point. Right. And he, the, during this Wolverine is with Jean, who's trying to piece her mind back together and she accidentally kisses Wolverine and he doesn't get as offended as as he has in the past and explain like I know it's you and Scott like I know I'm it was just an accident and um she's happy for him to say that and everything else but kind of the end of that piece he then um Scott is then interrogated basically and in asking about his son and he doesn't want to talk about it mostly due to the fact that his son is no longer around um, but nobody knows that. So he tries to lie and say that he doesn't have a kid with Gene, which wasn't also, it was not a lie, but like also a lie at the same time. Um, like he didn't have a child with Gene, at least not the Gene Grey everyone knows, but it was the clone of Gene Grey. So it's a whole cluster of stuff. Let me tell you. So that being said, all of that goes on, right? And she's like, well, why are you, you know, being like this and everything else? And he's basically like, hey, you know what? I've had to hide myself for so long because of what you people have done, meaning humans. And she's like, what? And he's like, I've just had it up to here. He goes, because thankfully we are different from each other. Because if I was anything like you all, or if we were anything like you guys, there'd be none of you left standing to begin with. And he storms off set. He goes upstairs. And he talks to who we think is Jean Grey, flirting, talking about their child, or specifically his child. Um... And then all of a sudden, the walls get broken into, and Jean Grey sees that Madeline Pryor is flirting with her husband on the astral plane, and the two of them begin to argue with each other. She then gets pissed off, and the two of them leave. <clears throat> so, Madeline Pryor goes back to whatever she was doing in Genosha, and we have Cyclops and Jean talking to each other in the real world. Scott is basically trying to explain to her that this has been only going on for a month, and he's just wanted to keep in track keep in contact with her because you know she is the mother of his child and that makes him feel something right and that's when they have an argument over who do you actually love scott you know she's not even the real me and he's like well who do you love he goes because all you keep talking about is the memory of my love you're not saying that you feel love for me and the two of them fight over that and then something happens where gene has a little bit of a headache and we'll get to that a little bit later um where she gets a nosebleed and everything else and we don't know why but now, that brings us over to Genosha. So, on the Genosha trip, Genoshin trip, I should say, 
We have Gambit, Rogue, and Magneto going to Genosha, because apparently the UN has requested Magneto to be there first. So they all come down and they greet, are greeted by the Senator and Madeline Pryor, who is apparently one of the council members of the Genosian Council, along with others that we'll discuss later. So the Genosian Council wanted to talk to Magneto alone before talking with anyone else. So he agreed, um, while Nightcrawler comes in and shows Gambit and Rogue this, this country of Genosha. Um, <clears throat> and it basically explains what's going on. We see a little bit of love interest between Rogue and Gambit, which is always nice. And Nightcrawler basically stating, like, hey, like, it's obvious you two love each other. Be together. And during that, um, Magneto is talking with the Genosian Council, which consists of Banshee, um, Moira, White Queen, Sebastian Shaw, Calypso, and Madeline Pryor. And they've all agreed that Magneto should be the leader of Genosha. He's reluctant at first, um, but states he will only do it on one condition. We don't know what that condition is yet. We find out a little bit later when he discusses it with Rogue, which happens to be that the only way he would rule is if Rogue was by his side. <clears throat> his thought process was, even though I think it was a little bit um, heavy-hearted, for sure, um, wanting to play a little bit of Rogue's heartstrings more than anything else, was the fact that he thought that the all-powerful Magneto would be best suited to have somebody who was mutant ability could actually feel everyone's pain, which he thinks would be an excellent form. So she doesn't give him an answer right away. Um, she goes and talks to Remy instead and explains her situation. And Remy's kind of just like sitting there listening. And he goes, so what are you going to do? <clears throat> Um, now, during this, Rogue explains her past with Magneto and how they met each other when she was still with M Mystique, although she didn't know it was Mystique at the time. Um, and they had a little, um, her and Magneto had a little bit of a thing because they found out his powers block hers and they could be physical together. And during this whole thing, Gambit's kind of like, you know, there are things that are more than skin deep. And she doesn't really understand that piece. Um, and he goes, fine, you do what you're going to do, but just know that. I'm not going to be in your corner anymore. I'm just going to be your friend. And that's going to be the end. So she kind of understands. So they're all at this Hellfire Gala is the best way to describe it. 90s power, right? And we have none other than the group come in and Magneto comes in and the senator or the head of the UN is livid by the fact that Magneto is going to be leader of Genosha. And she's trying to talk to the council, basically stating that she's not happy with this. He explains, well, on one condition, I said I would do it. And that was if um, I was allowed to ask for Rogue, to uh, an X-Men, to be uh, lead by my side, and specifically Rogue. And she was like, well, what did she say? And it was during that time we see Rogue fly in in an outfit. And that's when it's obvious that the two of them are who they are, um, are together. So he flies up to her, um, and they begin to dance. During this, once Gambit sees the two of them touch, he leaves. Metal and Pryor, on the other hand, was trying to boost up his spirits, but it wasn't working out, and she kind of just gave up on that front. So the two of them begin to dance and everything else, and it was at a moment where they kiss at the end of their dance, and she says, wow, Remy was right. <clears throat> Some things are more than skin deep. And she goes, I'm sorry. And during this, Madeline Pryor starts to have a nosebleed and everything else, and goes outside, and she sees her son, Cable, trying to warn everyone to get out of there. Nobody seems to know what's going on. And it was during that time, green blasts of energy come through. Cable disappears, goes back into, or goes back to his time, I should say. Um, and destruction blows up the entire area. And that's when Rogue and Magneto come out of the ground, ticked off more than anything else. <clears throat> and all of a sudden, they see this massive juggernaut of a, or a Godzilla-like um, sentinel creature which is destroying everything in Genosha with powerful energy blasts. Um, Nightcrawler comes in and teleports the two of them out of there, burning him significantly on this. <clears throat> he teleports him to a safe roof in the distance. Gambit is there, who reveals to everyone that Nightcrawler is not dead, but he's definitely wounded. And so Magneto orders both Gambit and Rogue to help him save the Morlocks that are stuck in the middle of the city. He states that he will distract their fire, 
Rogue will clear a path, and Gambit will be the one to get the um, Mor Morlocks out of there. During this, when we see everyone wounded, we see a lot of people injured. Sebastian's shawl, Calypso, um, <clears throat> Dazzler, and a few others that I can't quite remember. Uh, during this, we also see the head of the UN trying to get mutants out of there to safety as quickly as possible. And during this, we see people getting blown up little by little and sentinels coming flying into the air. So that's when Rogue and Gambit <clears throat> start destroying sentinels left and right while Gambit's riding on a motorcycle. And we have Magneto literally throwing massive amounts of metal at the sentinel. And that's when the sentinel realizes he's an omega level threat and begin to open fire on him. During this, we see massive amounts of destruction. Um, Rogue and Gambit are destroying a lot of Sentinels and everything else, and nothing seems to be able to stop them all. So during this, Gambit finally gets to the where the Morlocks are, blows up a Sentinel head, <clears throat> and tells everyone to follow him. He gets outside. We see Magneto getting blasted, smashed into a truck, and looking like he's badly beaten. We then see um, this massive blast come in about an Omega level threat, um, and the Sentinel is opening fire on them. Rogue is trying to protect Magneto, who is covering himself in magnetism, along with the Morlocks. Rogue is going to try to stop the Sentinel. Gambit tries to stop her. Magneto uses his, uh, his ability to wrap metal around the two of them to keep them safe. The blast happens, and all of a sudden his magnetism is stopped working, and we don't know if he's dead or alive along with all of the other Morlocks that he was trying to protect. It is unclear at this time. <clears throat> Rogue goes bananas, rips out of the metal, goes flying towards the Sentinel. Remy, or aka Gambit, gets on his motorcycle, gets on it, charges it, and slams it into Rogue, blows it up to get her out of there. That's when the Sentinel goes after the um, refugees, basically. The ones on the roof looking for sanctuary. That's when Gambit pulls out his staff, runs over, and yells that he is the bigger threat. They start blasting at him. He starts using his kinetic energy to blast himself high into the air and ready to strike down the Sentinel. That's when a metal spike comes up from the Sentinel and digs right into his ribcage, making him drop his staff. It brings him up to him, saying, uh, mutant, mutant threat has been eliminated. And that's when he begins to charge the entire robot and says, I am Gambit, mon ami. Remember it. And blows it up to smithereens. Causes a massive amount of destruction. In the rubble, we see Gambit burnt to a crisp, it looks like, and Rogue touching him with her bare skin. And realize, and she's crying, and all you hear her say is, I don't feel you, Remy. I don't feel you anymore. As she's crying. And that is how the episode ends. So a bunch of things to unpack here. One, we don't know what's happened to Magneto and the Morlocks. I don't think they're dead. Gambit. We do not see him dead, but I have a feeling he is dead. Um, I just do. I, I, it's weird to say, but I have a feeling he's dead out of all of them. That doesn't mean they don't do some time travel thing to get him back or anything, but this version of Gambit is dead. I'm just 99% sure of it. The X-Men see the destruction of Genosha, and Cyclops is more pissed off than anybody else. Everyone else is just sad, and um, they're getting ready to do what they need to do whatever that is, in the next episode. So I thought we were going to be getting a second part of Life and Death. Um, we did not, and so I'm very curious at what's going to be happening in the next episode, because if they go to Life and Death instead of answering these questions, well, that's going to stink. Um, but curious at what happens, because this episode was phenomenal. The um, animation was beautiful. The Genotians were beautiful. Seeing mutants that we had never seen before, mostly due to the fact that they were created after the 90s, <laughs> after 2000s, and they were added into the mix of Genosha, which I thought was incredible. We got to see so much out there, and I think it was just incredible in general. Um, and really seeing the destruction of Genosha is sad, but also like seeing how beautiful the civilization was for so long. Um, granted, it wasn't super long, but you understand what I'm saying. Um, overall, thought this episode was amazing. But uh, let me know what you guys thought about this episode in the comments down below. Did you like it? Did you not? And why? And as always, if you like the content you see, please make sure you like and subscribe down below. Other than that, this is going to be Beastly Eel signing out. Have a great night.